So when we're filling the orbitals, we fill them in order of the lowest energy orbital first. We only put two electrons in an orbital. And when we fill orbitals that have the same energy, they go in one at a time first and then two at a time. So we fill the lowest energy orbitals first. That's called the Aufbau principle. The Aufbau principle. Aufbau means building up. So we go from the lowest energy to the highest energy. Um, we only two electrons per orbital. That's called the Pauli exclusion principle. Two electrons in one orbital. And when we fill in orbitals of the same energy, they go in one at a time first. That's called Hund's rule. So with these three rules, the Aufbau principle, the Pauli exclusion principle, and Hund's rule, we can successfully fill in electrons on an orbital diagram. So let's look here. Here's an orbital diagram. When I have one electron, it goes in the lowest orbital. When I have two electrons, two electrons can fit here. So this is the lowest space available. So the second electron is going to go in there, but it has to be spin down. One up, one down. If I have the next electron, where does it go? 2s. That's the next lowest one. Aufbau principle tells me to go in there. And now where does the next electron go? Well, I can fit two of them in here according to the Pauli exclusion principle. So the next one should go in the lowest one, which is there. But it has to be spin down. So now, where does the next one go? Well, it'll go in 2p because that's the next lowest orbital. So where does the sixth electron go? Well, it does not go right here. The uh, Hund's rule, oops, Hund's rule tells me that when I put the sixth electron in, because all these two p orbitals are at the same energy, they're all degenerate, the next electron has to go here. And then when I put the seventh electron in, it has to go here. So Hund's rule says that electrons are like passengers on a bus. And so what that means is if you have ever ridden a bus before and you get on the bus and there's already people on the bus and you're looking for somewhere to sit down, where do you sit? If there's people on the bus already and you get on the bus and you don't know any of them, you go and sit in an open seat, right? So here's the bus, it's got all these open seats. If there's people in some of the seats already and you get on the bus, you're not going to sit with the people, you're going to sit in an open seat, right? So that's what electrons want to do too. Electrons are repelled by each other, they find each other repulsive. So since electrons are repelled by each other, they don't want to sit in the same seat if there are other seats available. They have to go in the lowest energy seat, but look, all three of these seats have the same energy. So this one's here, the next one's gonna go in its own seat. It doesn't wanna go together with this one. So passengers on a bus. All right, so now I've got seven electrons. Where does the eighth one go? It could go in any of these, because they're all the same, but it has to be down. So eight goes there, nine goes there, 10 goes there. Where does 11 go? Well, 11 goes in the lowest. Where does 12 go? Here, where does 13 go? 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and so on. Fill these up. Um, okay, so now, look what happened here. We went 3s, 3p, and the next lowest one is 4s. So look at that, 4s is underneath 3d. So it's really weird, but I actually fill up 4s before I'm even done filling up 3. I fill up the 4s first. So it goes 3p, 4s, and then I start doing 3d. But 3d has five degenerate orbitals. So one, two, three, four, five. They're going to go in one at a time first. And then they partner up. Down, 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 down. So it goes 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p. Here, 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 here. And then, look, 5s is underneath 4d. So then 5s will fill up, and then 4d. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 
one, two, three, four, five. So when we're filling up electrons, um, we have to apply these three rules. The Aufbau principle, the lowest energy first, the Pauli exclusion principle, two electrons per shell, and Hund's rule, like passengers on a bus. They want to go in one at a time first when there's orbitals at the same energy. All right, so there's a graphical way to represent these electrons like we just did. That's called an orbital diagram. And there's also a way to write that same exact information out like this. That's called an electron configuration. It's important to be able to, to look at electron configuration and an orbital diagram and be able to go back and forth because those two representations contain the same information. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we are filling up the electrons we just showed, we go 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d. So you see it kind of jumps back and forth. It goes 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d, and they kind of start going back and forth. So that same information is down here. Look at Krypton. It has 36 electrons. So if we were to put them here, they'd go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 20, 2, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36. So Krypton would have all of these filled. And so uh, that's one way to represent the electrons in Krypton, 36 electrons, filling them in from the bottom up. Another way to represent that would be with an electron configuration. We would write it like this. 1s2, remember, when we write, when I write the electron configuration, 1s is talking about this orbital, and how many electrons are in it? Two. So let me actually go through and fill these in. So, krypton, the electron configuration of krypton, 1s2, 1s, there's two electrons in it, 2s2, 2s, there's two electrons in it. The next orbital is 2p, how many electrons are in 2p? 2, 4, 6, there's six electrons in 2p. What's the next orbital? 3s, how many electrons are in 3s? Two. What's the next orbital? 3p. How many electrons are in 3p? 2, 4, 6. All right, what's the next orbital? 4s. How many electrons are in 4s? 2. What's the next orbital? 3d. How many electrons are in 3d? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. All right, what's the next orbital? 4p. How many electrons are in 4p? 2, 4, 6. So this is called an electron configuration. It's just a way that we give each electron inside of Krypton a name. It's like the quantum, that's what the quantum numbers are doing. The, the quantum numbers are giving each electron a name. And we name it by a series of numbers. So this is the, the name and the position of every electron that's in Krypton. 2 plus 2 plus 6 plus 2 plus 6 plus 2 plus 10 plus 6 equals 36. The 36 electrons that are inside of Krypton. So this information is telling me the same thing that this information is telling me. The difference is that this information tells me something about um, when I have electrons that are in the 2p orbitals, if this says 2p3, for example, then I don't necessarily know if they are single or not. Of course, they can only ever go in one at a time. So if it says 2p3 and we drew this out, we could see that they were single. But the visual representation can sometimes give us an easier way to see that information than the electron configuration. But really, this map 
And this line of letters and numbers are exactly the same thing. It's telling us the same information. So, um, Sometimes we'll see orbital diagrams written vertically, just like this. In fact, that's the most common way to see an orbital diagram written. The space in between the orbitals is representative of the energy difference between there. The energy gap between 1s and 2s is far bigger than the energy gap between 4s and 5s. It's far bigger than the energy gap between 2s and 2p. The gap between 2s and 2p is bigger than the gap between 3s and 3p, and that's bigger than the gap between 4s and 4p. So these relative gaps are important to tell us the actual difference in energy between these orbitals. Sometimes in this book um, and in some books we'll see um, orbital diagrams written horizontally like this. So it gives us the same information 1s2, 2s2, 2p, and we'll see 2, 4, 6. We can fill them up like that. But what's lost in this representation is the relative energy levels. So don't be confused if you see it like this. It's just still telling us the orbitals and how many electrons are in each one. Um, they're, they're equivalent. This horizontal map and the vertical map here are the same. Um, this one is just kind of missing some information. So we can see here for lithium has three electrons. The electron configuration, 1s2, two electrons in 1s, one electron in 2s. And this is what the orbital diagram looks like. Beryllium has four electrons, 2 plus 2. Here's the orbital diagram. Boron has 5, 2 plus 2 plus 1. Carbon has 6, 2 plus 2 plus 2. And those two electrons in 2p, because of Hund's rule, they go in one at a time, like passengers on a bus. Okay, valence electrons are the outermost electrons, um, the ones that are in the outer shell. So um, we can always tell the electrons that are in the outer shell by the um, orbital diagram or by the electron configuration because the ones that are in the outer shell are the ones that have the highest number. So if I'm looking at this uh, electron configuration here, these electrons are in the valence shell because four Oh, and these, excuse me, because 4 is the highest number. 4 is bigger than 1, it's bigger than 2, it's bigger than 3. So the electrons that are in the outer shell are in the fourth shell. Which electrons are in the outer shell here? The ones that are in the fifth shell, because 5 is further out than 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. So the valence electrons are the ones that are in the outermost shell, the one with the highest number. These are valence. And everything else that's not valence, these are called, any, everything else that's underneath, these are called core electrons. So these two are in four, these are called valence. But these, including the 3D, are part of core electrons. So sometimes it's tricky that the, four, the 3D here is kind of in between the 4s. The 4s are the valence electrons. There are 8 valence electrons. The 3s are not part of the valence electrons. They are part of the core electrons. They are underneath that outer shell. The outer shell is the fourth shell. So when you read an electron configuration, make sure you find all of the orbitals that have that outer number. 4 appears twice in this one. If we were looking at 3, we have 3s, 3p, and 3d. We would have to count all of those if 3 was the highest number. Count all of the electrons in each of those orbitals. So again, here's krypton. There are 28 core electrons, those in shells 1 and 2 and 3. And there are 8 valence electrons, the electrons that are in shell 4, 2 plus 6. In rubidium, there are 37 total electrons, and the ones that are in the valence shell, there's only one in a valence shell. This one, this one electron in 5s, there's one valence electron. Krypton has eight valence electrons. So in rubidium, the set of quantum numbers for that one 5s electron is n equals 5, so that's my principal quantum number. 
L equals zero because L equals zero tells me that I have an S electron. ML equals zero because um, for, S elect for S orbitals, ML is always zero. And MS is either plus one half or minus one half. It could be either because those are equivalent. So when I'm trying to give the principle, if I'm trying to give the quantum numbers for a 5s electron, then it could be this set of quantum numbers, and ms could be plus 1 half or minus 1 half. Okay, so for an electron in the 2p sublevel, a set of quantum numbers would be n equals 2, l equals 1, because l equals 1 for p orbitals, ml could be minus 1 or 0 or plus 1, and we could it could have any of those values because in 2p there are three degenerate orbitals, minus 1, 0, and plus 1. And ms could equal minus 1 half or plus 1 half because there are two electrons. One of them could be spin down, minus 1 half, or it could be spin up, plus 1 half. So here's the electron configuration for the first um, 18 elements. Well, at least the electron configuration in the outermost shell. So um, in the first row, we have the the uh, 1s electrons, the 1s orbital, he helium, hydrogen, and helium get 1s electrons. And then lithium and beryllium have 2s, and then boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon are filling up the p's, 2p1, 2p2, 2p3, 2p4, 2p5, 2p6. And then we start over down here on, on the third row, those are 3s, and then we skip that gap and we'll get fill up to 3p. So what we see is that on the periodic table, when we're filling in the electrons, um, the periodic table corresponds to the energy levels on the, of the orbitals. So the blue part over here, the alkali metals and the alkaline earth metals, these are called the S block. So this blue part over here, these are part of the S block, and helium is part of the S block too, if we moved it over here. All of those in the middle here are part of the D block. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. These yellow ones are all part of the D block. The pink ones over here are all part of the P block. I'm filling P orbitals when I am over here. And the green ones over here are part of the F block, where I'm filling in F orbitals. So S, D, P, F. So what does this mean? It means that when I have a periodic table, I can figure out the, the electron configuration of any element, and I, can I don't have to memorize this whole thing here. How do you remember that it goes 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 5d, when all the numbers are going back and forth? How could you possibly remember that? You don't have to. If you know how to read the periodic table, it goes like this. 1s1, 1s2. All right, start over on the next row. 2s1, 2s2. All right, so let's skip the piece for a second, start over on the next row. 3s1, 3s2, 4s1, 4s2, 5s1, 5s2. I can only ever fit two electrons in s orbitals, and the s orbital corresponds to the number of the row. So in the first row, over here, I'm filling up 1s orbitals. In the second row, in these elements, I'm filling up 2s orbitals. The third row, 3s. The fourth row, 4s. Fifth row, 5s. Sixth row, 6s. Seventh row, 7s. All right, so it goes 1s1, 1s2. 2s1, 2s2. Now we go to the fifth element, 2p1, 2p2. 2p3, 2p4, 2p5, 2p6. How many electrons can fit in the p orbitals? Six. How many elements are in the p block? One, two, three, four, five, six. So two electrons fit in an s orbital, and there's two electrons across the s block. Six electrons fit in p orbitals, and there's six elements across the p block. So when I'm in the p block in the second row, I'm filling up two p orbitals. When I'm in the third row, I'm filling up 3p orbitals. In the fourth row, 4p orbitals, 5p orbitals, 6p orbitals, 7p orbitals. All right, so now, how do we know when the numbers start switching around? All right, so up until 3p, or 4s1, I should say, it, it kind of goes in order. It goes 1s1, skip this big gap, 1s2. 
All right, then we go to the third element. 2s1, 2s2. Now skip this gap, go to the fifth. 2p1, 2p2, 2p3, 2p4, 2p5, 2p6. See, there's still 2s, 2p. Now we start over in the third row. 3s, skip this big gap. 3p. We're still 3 and 3, so the numbers haven't mixed up yet. 3s and 3p. Now start over in the fourth row. 4s, and the first row here in the d block, these are d orbitals. So, but they're 3d orbitals. So we're in the fourth row, and in the fourth row, I have 4s orbitals. In the fourth row, I have 4p orbitals. But in the fourth row, I have 3d orbitals. So the d orbitals, d orbitals are row, minus, one or because the row is also corresponding to the principal quantum number I could say that d elements are n minus one s block elements it's just n the number of the row corresponds to the number of the orbital three third row three s electrons seventh row seven s electrons seventh row six d because the D block electrons are always the number of the row minus one. Seventh row means that we have seven minus one, six D six D electrons. All right, so then we go through this. We have four S, three D, four P. Start over again. Five S, four D, five P. <coughs> Excuse me. Start over again. Six S, but now we jump down here. So we go 6s, 5d, but look, number 58 is not here. Number 58 is actually part of the lanthanides down here. So we've got to go down and do this section next. So remember this section, the yellow ones are the d block, but the green ones are the f block. So this one goes 6s, 5d, but then the green ones are 4f. My first f block elements are 4f. I'm in the sixth row. So in the sixth row, I have 6s. In the sixth row, I have 5d. And in the sixth row, I have 4f. 6s, 5d, and 4f. So the f is row minus 2. So whatever row we're in, I know what, if I'm in the seventh row, what kind of d orbitals do I have? 6d. If I'm in the seventh row, what kind of f orbitals do I have? 5f. If I'm in the seventh row, what kind of p orbitals do I have? 7p. Because s and p are just the same as the number of the row. So we can use this information to literally read the periodic table and go from 1 to three, four, five, six, and just count our way up the periodic table. And if we know where the S block is, and we know where the P block is, and the D block, and the F block, and I know that Ds are row minus one, and I know that Fs are row minus two, then I can look at any element on the periodic table and know what its electron configuration is. So you don't have to memorize the order, you just have to memorize this right here. S, P, D, F, Ds are minus one, Fs are minus two. And then the whole, all of that information is built into the periodic table. You're really learning how to read the periodic table from top to bottom, left to right. So again, for, for this blank one, let's just pick a blank one here. Let's pick this blank one right here. I don't even know what it is. Let's write the electron configuration of this element right here. So this element right here, what row is this? Sometimes it's helpful to just rewrite the row over here. Remember, this is row 6 and this is row 7 because it kind of goes this part here and then 7 kind of comes down like this. All right, so this is, this is actually row 6 and row 7. 
So if I'm down in row six, then I know that I've already filled up definitely all the way to here. And then this funny stuff is going to happen where I go down and have to change rows, right? So let's fill up everything until here, and then we'll work on that part. So let's go up till 6s2. So how does this go? It's going to go 1, s, 2. I'm actually going to write this on the top. 1, s, 2. Because this one and this one are filled, right? I'm going to go all the way from 2 all the way up to this one. 2, s, 2, because this is filled. 2p6, because this is filled. 3s2, through here. 3p6, through here. And now I do this part, 4s2. And now I do this part. This is a d block, so I'm doing d orbitals. What d orbitals am I doing? Well, I'm in the fourth row. I'm doing 3d orbitals, because Remember, the number of d orbital is the row minus 1. So if I'm in the fourth row, I have three d orbitals. How many do I have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 3 d, 10. What's next? Fourth row, p block. That means these are 4, p, 6. What's next? 5, s, 2. What's next? This one. I'm in the fifth row and I'm doing the D block. So in the fifth row, I'm talking about 4D. All right, what's next? This one. I'm in the fifth row and this is the P block. So these are 5P. What's next? Sixth row. 6, S, 2. All right, and now the funny stuff is going to happen. So some of these. Uh, start to uh, the electron configuration kind of mixes up a little bit and we'll see that here in a second but let's just go through this as if it didn't this first one is D I'm in the sixth row this is the D block so that's 5 D 1 and then I'm going to drop down here so these are uh, now I'm in the sixth row and these are F electrons so the next part is for me to go from here to here so I'm in the sixth row. These are F electrons. F is row minus 2. So if I'm in the sixth row, then these are 4F. So 4F1, 4F2, 4F3, 4F4, 4F5, 4F6, 4F7. 4F7. All right, so I don't need to know what element it is. I don't really need to know anything except its position in the periodic table. Which one of these am I talking about? Am I, and I need to know the S block, the D block, the P block, and the F block. And I need to know that when I'm in the fifth row, I'm talking about 4D. When I'm in the sixth row, I'm talking about 4F. So if I can, if I can memorize that information, then you can read the periodic table from left to right and generate this, which is a really, really, really long electron configuration, but this is the electron configuration for this element, whatever this one is. So let's see. That is the seventh one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here, that's gadolinium, 6s2, 4f7, 5d1, 5d1. All right, so we did it. This is, I didn't even need to know what element it was. I just needed to know where it was in the periodic table, and I can write the entire, the entire electron configuration. Now notice how they didn't write everything before 6s2. It took this whole thing and kind of left this whole part out. Well, that would be really nice if you could leave that whole part out and just write from the beginning of the sixth row, because that's what they did. They started here in the sixth row and just wrote from the sixth row up to here. What do we have? So the reason that they're able to do that is because we can use this trick where if I look at the element of interest and I go backwards, sixth row, fifth row, and I find the uh, noble gas, the closest noble gas that came before. So I can't go forwards to find a noble gas. I have to go backwards. And when I go backwards to find a noble gas, I get to xenon. 
is the first one I get to. Element 64, go backwards, I get to element 54, which is xenon. This noble gas has this uh, electron configuration. Look, 5s2, 5p6. 5s2, 5p6. That's the valence shell that I've written under here. So this whole thing that I have in red, this is actually the electron configuration of xenon. Xenon. So when I want to write the electron configuration of gadolinium, which is what I have here, GD, gadolinium, I could write this whole thing like I did, or we can take xenon in brackets. And that xenon in brackets represents this whole piece right here. This whole thing is now xenon in brackets. But I have to write everything from xenon after xenon. So everything that comes after xenon is this part that's not in the box. 6s2, 5d1, 4f7. So this is also gadolinium. These are, I could write this, and that would be correct for the electron configuration of gadolinium, or we could write this, and this would be correct for the electron configuration of gadolinium, where I've done kind of a shortcut, and I, I shortcutted this whole piece here with just xenon. Now, you can only do the shortcut with a noble gas. I can only do neon in brackets, or helium in brackets, or argon, or krypton, or xenon, or radon. That's it. You can, if I wanted to do gadolinium, sometimes I see students say, oh, I'm going to write the electron configuration of gadolinium, well, I'm just going to go europium in brackets and then 5d1 and then just write the last electron. You can't just go one, ele one element back and write that one in, ele in, ele in brackets. If you want to do this shortcut, this has to be a noble gas. It has to be an element that's here in this last row. It's the only ones that can go in brackets. Okay, the last thing, let's see. Let's, let's give one a shot. What is the electron configuration of indium? Well, first we have to find it on the, on the periodic table. I'm trying to draw dots here. Indium. Indium is... Where is that little bugger? Here it is, indium. All right, so, oh, I don't want to look at that. 49. It's this one. I don't want to cheat. So this is indium. If you're looking at a periodic table that doesn't have the electron configuration written right on it. So if we want to write the electron configuration of this element right here, then remember we have to write everything before it. So let's do both. Let's do the long version and let's do the shortcut version. So in the long version, here's five. So I'm going to go to the fifth row and I'm ending right here, which is 5p1. So we'll do 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d10. 5p1. This one right here, 5p1. I'm in the fifth row. This is the p block, 5p1. So here's indium in the long form. And if I want to do the shortcut, then I can go back and use this one. So this is krypton. And krypton is everything up through, let's see, what is that? 4s, 4p6. So everything up through 4p6 is actually krypton in brackets. So then I just write 5s2, 4d10, 5p1. And that's also the electron configuration of indium. So the long way and the shortcut, those are both fine. What are the quantum numbers of the electron in the 5p orbital? All right, so 5p1. So n equals 
5 it equals the shell the number of the shell when I'm talking about a p orbital l equals 1 so for l remember s equals 0 p equals 1 d equals 2 f equals 3 so those are the values of l so when I have a p orbital l equals 1 m sub l could be negative 1, or it could be 0, or it could be positive 1. If I specified further and I said this is px, then I might say, oh, well, px is minus 1. Or if it's py, py is 0. Or if it's pz, pz is plus 1. But if we haven't specified which of those three it is, it's just p, it could be any of those three. And finally, ms could be spin up, plus 1 half, or it could be spin down, minus one half. Okay, so uh, sometimes the electron configuration does not go in order. So we saw in this graph here that the, sp the splitting of the orbitals, the orbitals split and the energy changes, and we get these energy differences here. Well, these, these gaps between the orbitals are not equal for different elements. They change. So sometimes you can see that the difference here between 3d and 4p is pretty small, or the difference between 3d and 4s is pretty small. So sometimes the electrons go into 4s first, and sometimes the electrons go into 3d first, because that gap is really small, and different elements sometimes change the order. So let's look here, and we can see that. This one goes 3d1, 3d2, 3d3, 3d5. 4s1, 3d5. So this one, something funky happened here. It lost a, an, an s electron. It went from 4s2 to 4s1. And it should be 3d4, but instead it's 3d5. And then we get the s back, 4s2, 3d5. 3d6, 3d7, 3d8. Oh, something weird happened again. 4s1, 3d10. 4s2, 3d10. So sometimes these orbitals fill up out of order. That happens often in the D block, and it happens often in the F block. It doesn't happen in P or S. S and P always fill up in order. But sometimes D and F, sometimes they switch around. Like here, look at this one. 4F1, 5D1. 4F3. So 5, that 5D1 disappeared. 4f4, 4f5, 4f6, 4f7, 5d1, that 5d1 came back. 4f9, the 5d1 disappeared again. So they, they jump around here when we start. The, there are irregular electron configurations. So you don't have to memorize any of these because I, I don't even know them. They start to get pretty weird and they go out of order here. But you should know the ones here in the first row. You should know that chromium is uh, out of order, and you should know that copper is out of order. And the reason is because this D block can hold 10 electrons. So look at this one. It, it wants, what happens is it goes D2, D3, D5. It skips over D4 because it's really in a hurry to get to D5. And look, D5 is represented twice, D5, D5. That's because D5 is really stable. So when I have a half-filled subshell, like five electrons in D, which can hold 10, so when it's half-filled, it's really stable. So this skips right over four because it's really anxious to get to D5 because D5 is really stable. So D5 appears twice. And here too, D10, same thing with D10. D10 appears twice. And so it appears twice because it's really anxious to get to D10 because having that full filled D shell makes it very stable. So really, if we look at this graphically, what's happening is we have uh, 4s as two electrons. And here we have 3d. We have 1, 2, 3. And it should, the next one, chromium, should be 3d4. It should go like this. But it's not 3d4, it's 3d5. So where does that other electron come from? Well, it's this one, one of these. 
moves over here. So now, one of the electrons that was in 4s, it moves over to 3d. So, chromium looks like it should be 4s2, 3d4, but that's wrong. Chromium is actually 4s1, 3d5, because one of these s electrons jumps up here to complete this half shell that makes this stable. So the same thing happens in copper. Copper is 4s2, 3d1, please fill in one at a time first, and two at a time, two, three, four. It looks like it should be this. Copper looks like it should be 4s2, 3d9. But instead, it's, so copper, looks like 4s2, 3d9, but it's not. Copper is 4s1, 3d10, because the same thing happens. One of these electrons, it wants to complete this shell. This shell only needs one more to be full. So it jumps up here, so it can fill up that shell. That makes that shell really stable, kind of abandons this one. But that's okay because the energy difference still makes up for it up here. And we get 4s1, 3d10, because one of these jumps up here. So chromium and copper in that first row, they look a little bit different. Chromium and copper, they're kind of out of order. So um, be on the lookout for those. And you can tell um, that silver and gold, they have that same irregularity, 4s1, 3d10. 5s1, 4d10, 6s1, 5d10. So all of these ones in this column, they all have that same irregularity, copper, silver, and gold. You know that like copper, silver, and gold are um, similar metals. They're, we call them noble metals. They're good at conducting elect, uh, electricity. They don't react with other um, elements as much as other metals. So they, they are similar because they have similar electron configuration. Um, and in chromium too, chromium and molybdenum, they share this irregularity, but by the time we get to tungsten, it doesn't. Tungsten looks normal, 6s2, 5d4. So the, it jumps around a bit here, and just be aware of sometimes, sometimes these uh, electron configurations are irregular. So yeah, here's some of the ones that we talked about. All right, so um, let's look at what happens when an atom forms an ion. So we can look at a periodic table and say, because all of the elements that are in this column are gonna have a minus two, and all of the elements in this column, if they become ions, they're minus one. All of the elements here, here are plus one. All the elements here are plus two. So if I know the electron configuration of fluorine, then what's the electron configuration of fluorine minus? So fluorine is 1s2, 2s2, 2p5, right? Because it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. F minus, what does F minus have that F doesn't? Well, it has one extra electron, right? Where is that one extra electron going to go? It's going to go into this empty p orbital. So F minus is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. It just gets that extra electron. Let's look at O. Oxygen, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Right? 1, 2, 3, 4. Oxygen gets a minus 2 charge. O2 minus. So when it gets a minus two charge, it gets two extra electrons. Where do they go? 2p5 and 2p6. So look, F minus 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. 
O2 minus 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. They're the same. Their electron configuration when they're neutral is not the same, but when they become ions, their electron configuration is the same. Uh, let's do another one. Let's look at uh, sodium. Sodium is 1s2, 2s1. Oh no, I didn't mean sodium, did I? Yeah, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. So here's sodium in the third row, or it looks like the second row because hydrogen's up here. Third row, 3s1. So sodium, when it becomes Na+, what happens to it? It loses an electron. So which one does it lose? Well, it loses that one electron in the outer s orbital. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, because it loses this one. Well, look at that. Na+, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. F minus 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. O2 minus 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. They all, all of these ions have the same electron configuration. So that's not an accident. That electron configuration is the electron configuration of neon. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. What is neon? Neon is a noble gas. What is it about noble gases that makes them different? They don't react with anything. Why don't they react with anything? Because they have a full shell of electrons. So a full shell of electrons makes this atom very, very stable. It doesn't want to share its electrons with anybody because this is a very stable arrangement. So this very stable arrangement this atom wants to copy that very stable arrangement. When it does, it becomes a plus ion. This atom wants to copy that very stable arrangement. When it does, it becomes a minus ion. This atom wants to copy that stable arrangement. When it does, it gets this electron configuration. So these ions all have the charges they do because they're all trying to get the same number of electrons as a noble gas because that makes them particularly stable. Okay, what is the electron configuration of the ion formed by nitrogen? So N is 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. What is the charge on N? 3 minus. So we, it's going to gain 3 electrons. Where are they going to go? To fill up that 2p orbital. So nitrogen is going to look just like neon, just like the others. What is the electron configuration of the ion formed by fluorine? We already did that one. What is the electron configuration of the ion formed by aluminum? 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1. So we have to find aluminum on the periodic table. Aluminum is here. It's the first element in the P block, so 3P1. Okay, so aluminum is going to lose three electrons. It's going to become Al3. So which three is it going to lose? One, two, three. The three that are in the outer valence shell. So it's going to look like this, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So they all want to look like neon, get the, the electron configuration of neon. So some transition metals can form more than one ion. Um, iron can form a plus two cation and a plus three cation. So 
um, different ions, plus two or plus three, are going to have different electron configurations. So when, they, when we look at the electron configuration of different atoms, when an atom has unpaired electrons, we call that paramagnetic. When an electron has all electrons that are paired, they're all up and down, there's none that are all by themselves, there's no single electrons, we call this diamagnetic. Elements that are paramagnetic with unpaired electrons will be attracted to a magnetic field. So silver has an unpaired electron, it's paramagnetic. It will be attracted to a magnetic field. Zinc does not have any unpaired electrons, it's diamagnetic, it will not be attracted to a magnetic field. If we have silver plus, silver plus loses this electron, then it will become diamagnetic and silver plus is not attracted to a magnetic field. So we can determine whether an element is going to be attracted to a magnetic field by whether or not it has unpaired electrons in its orbital diagram. So here's iron 3 plus. The electron configuration of iron 3 plus has five unpaired electrons. That makes iron 3 plus incredibly magnetic because all of these are unpaired. Um, and you know that iron is one of those elements that's known for its magnetism. So why does this cause um, elements to be magnetic? Because when there's only one electron, then within different atoms, that electron can be pointing in different directions, like different poles of a magnet are not lined up. They're all kind of random. But if I apply a magnetic field to that substance, these electrons are able to move. So they'll line themselves up with the magnetic field. So a magnetic field it gives these all of these single electrons a direction to point. And so they'll all point in the same direction. And when they do that, it creates a magnetic force. And so then this substance would be attracted to a magnet. If I remove the magnetic field, all of those electrons relax and start pointing their own random directions again. What is the electron configuration of Fe2 plus? All right, so let's look at Fe. And Fe is... Here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 3D6 is where Fe ends. So 3D6, 1, 1S2, one 2S2, two 2P6, two 3S2, 3P6, 4S2, 3D6. Six. Is that right? I can't remember. 3D6? 3D6, iron. Okay. All right, so 2 plus, it's going to lose two electrons. Which two is it going to lose? Is it going to go from 3D6 to 3D4? We might think so because 3D is the last one we wrote, but whenever an atom loses electrons, it loses electrons from the valence shell. And this is the valence shell. This is four. Four fills up. Four is outside of three. So if I'm going to lose two electrons, I'm going to lose the two that are on the outside, those two. So Fe2 plus has an electron configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d6. It lost these two electrons. So in the D block, what do they look like? One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, Fe3 plus is going to lose one more electron. Where is it going to lose it from? It's going to lose the electron from here, from 3D6. So then it's going to have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d5. These are the 3d electrons. And what do the 3d electrons look like for Fe3 plus? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So which one is more magnetic? 
2 plus or 3 plus? 3 plus is because it has more unpaired electrons. This has 5 unpaired electrons, and 2 plus only has 4 unpaired electrons. So Fe3 plus is more magnetic.